Good. All right. Uh, we are delighted uh, to welcome our guest, Hawa Ibrahim, today. Uh, we're up against not only a series of uh, lectures and visitors and all the rest of it this week, but also the nicest day that we've had in uh, 2012. So thank you for uh, coming and joining with us in this conversation. I'm delighted to introduce to you Hawa Ibrahim. Uh, Hawa spent last year here at Harvard Divinity School as part of the WSRP program. And this year, she is visiting lecture on women's studies and Islamic law. I looked over Hawa's CV, and uh, I found so many initials in the various academic work that she's done. I don't even know what they mean, but there are lots of L's. Uh, and I think it guarantees that she is, in fact, a very well-trained lawyer and scholar. I'll just give you a little taste. She has an LLM in International Studies from American University an MA that I do recognize in International Law and Diplomacy, and an LLB, both from Joss University in Nigeria, and a BL from Nigeria Law School in Lagos. In addition to all of those Ls that she's earned, Hawa has been awarded three honorary doctorates, as well as the Cavalieri Award, the highest human rights award from the Italian government, and the 2005 Sakharov Prize for Freedom of Thought from the European Parliament, an honor awarded to individuals or organizations for efforts on behalf of human rights and freedom. She's been a visiting professor at St. Louis University of Law and at Stonehill College, a World Fellow at Yale University, a Radcliffe Fellow, and a, lots of fellows, and a fellow at both the Human Rights Program and the Islamic Legal Studies Program here at Harvard. I was also a senior partner at Ares Law Firm and has worked as lead attorney with a team devoted to the cause of human rights for women in Nigeria. Now we're getting down to uh, what we find so exciting uh, with Hawa and her presence with us here. She's adopted an interdisciplinary approach to study the theoretical foundations of Sharia law and its influence on legal practice. This has been the basis of her work on human rights for women in West Africa. Hawa has won a number of precedent-setting cases for women before Islamic Sharia courts. This has been really tremendous groundbreaking work and we are so proud to have her with us. It was while she was at Radcliffe that Hawa developed her book project, which now has been accepted for publication and the book is entitled Practicing Law in Sharia Courts, Seven Strategies. Uh, and Hawa it will speak to us today on Sharia judicial processes, the case of Fatima Usman. Hawa, it's a pleasure to have you with us this year and today. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much for taking the day off to come here. Uh, Jane, thank you for the generous introduction. Um, the past three years at Harvard, I had one experience I want to share with you. I found that this institution, everybody has a name for it. But for me, my experience has been, it has been a key that open opportunities. And I have, I can, I'm a living example of Harvard being a key that open opportunities, and I'll mention that in a moment. So I thank Harvard so much for having me here for the past three years and a half. I also want to thank um, the Dean, Dean Graham, Jane Smith, for your generosity and your wisdom. I want to thank um, Anne, dear Anne, and Jacob, and my fellow RAs. I want to thank Catherine and Samia, and my research assistant, Iklas. But I saw Baba Johansson here, and I'm truly grateful you kept me at your program for one year uh, in 2009 to 2010. Thank you so much for coming. But most importantly, I want to thank all of you. I saw my neighbors. They came all the way from Sudbury, my new neighbors. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my husband is here. I think this is the first time he's attending a program I'm speaking at. <laughs> so, welcome. Um, my students, some of my students in the fall. And so thank you so much for coming. 
Um, but let me say here, um, opening up opportunity, Harvard as a key. In October, the Sultan came here. And I want to use this opportunity to thank so much the Divinity School for making it happen and the Center for the Studies of World Religion and every other person that put their hand on the deck for it to happen. It had tears. But the good book says, weeping may come during the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And for me, it was a joy that had come, that is coming. After the event, I was in Nigeria. And the first thing that I was given was this bunch of newspapers, New Nigeria. And the entire visit of the Sultan was serialized in this, I mean, the, uh, the, the talk he gave. Now, it has been serialized in many newspapers. But for it to be in New Nigeria, it's really great for us because this is the paper that is mainly in the northern part of the country. But other papers like leadership, like uh, the Guardian, and this, they all carried it. But it's the beyond the visit that is important. And I guess we will get to hear a little bit about beyond the visit in this discussion. I want to thank Jacob when I, saw, when I mentioned tears. Jacob gave me his shoulders. And thank you. I know what it meant uh, during those moments to want to cry. And I'm just dripping all over the carriage house. And I'll come to you and give me your shoulders for me to cry on. The idea to bring uh, the Sultan was hatched in Anne's Browder's office. And it was just an amazing, amazing partner I have in her. But we had a huge uh, members of the community here at the Divinity School across the university that put together. The, we have a wonderful team. So I just want to say thank you to Harvard and say beyond the visit, a lot of things is happening. Uh, I have written an article which was published in journals and Nigerian newspapers, which is Boko is Halal. Boko is not haram. And uh, I was focusing on girls' child education. And let me use this opportunity to say today is a special day. Apart from the fact that the weather is beautiful and, and great, today is the eighth day of March 2012. Today is the International Women's Day celebrated globally. And I want us to remember this day as we think through this discussion and hope that the transforming powers of women is just to begin. Um, it's begin it has started and we are just going on and riding on the shoulders of people that have put some foundation for us to move on. So happy International Women's Day. Uh, let me make some few disclaimers before I start. As you could hear from what I've said so far, English is my fifth language, so if I murder English, so please forgive me. Um, I also want to mention that I am not an Islamic scholar, I'm just a lawyer, so I'm going to speak from a perspective of just a lawyer. I was a prosecutor, I started practice as a prosecutor for eight years in the Ministry of Justice in my state of Bauchi. And then from 1996, October, to 2008, when I came to Radcliffe, I was a defense lawyer. And I had a legal firm, which I started in the city of Bauchi. Uh, between 1999, when Sharia was introduced, and my first case was in 2000, to 2008, when I came, and up to last month, in, um, actually in January 2012, I have been handling cases in the Sharia court back in Nigeria. And I've been part of over 150 cases. Um, and I'm going to speak to only one case today, but I just want to mention this uh, as a starter. My presentation is divided into three broadly. Um, I will show you some slides which will be a bigger picture of what I will be speaking to. Then I will speak to specific, which is the judicial process. And I'll go a little bit legalistic, and if you don't understand, just wave at me, I'll repeat myself for some of this legal time. I'll try to speak English, but when I get into Latin from what I think I know, um, you know, just get me back to court. And then I'll conclude by sharing some beyond the courtroom. How do we move on? The cases, the clients, the lawyers, and I will conclude uh, finally with some few other thoughts. So this is Fatima and Amadou. Actually, it's a case of Fatima. But Fatima, in this first case I handled, that a man was also sentenced to die by stoning. 
in Fatima and Amadou, uh, our introduction. This is Fatima and that is Amadou. Um, I want to speak to, maybe just mention this by passing. I have, I've said it in the past, but I just want to make mention. If you look at the map, within a contextual perspective, you see how big the continent is. So if somebody is talking about Africa, just be careful what you are hearing. What part of Africa are you talking about? You can take the United States and Alaska and put it in this continent. You can take China and put it in the continent. You can take Europe and put it in the continent, and you still have those brown spaces that has no, that no country. So that's huge is the continent. I just want to just make that as a poser. Africa is huge, beautiful, and rich in human resources and otherwise. It has a population now, according to United Nations, hitting to about one billion people on the continent. Um, what we have next is a slide about the Western Africa. We have about 16 countries in the West. You could see Nigeria right there, and the, the city is Abuja. Um, I just wanted to mention a few things here. Nigeria has the largest population in the continent. Uh, from the statistic we have from the State Department as of this week, it has 162,471,000 people. Nigeria, as of September 2011, is the largest, the fifth largest importer of oil in the United States, is the fifth largest importer of cocoa, aluminum, rubber, and other special items in the United States. This information we also got from the United States Department of State. Uh, is the sixth largest Muslim country in the world. And this is from Wikipedia. So I just wanted to mention that for the slide. Nigeria and Sharia. So this is the map of the country. And what I did here was to show you with the, with the first map, the green color is the northern Nigeria. And we spoke about the Sultan. The Sultan is sort of is the head of Muslims in the country, but a lot of his powers in this. this about 80 million, or a little bit more in the, in the, in the country. Um, then the other map of Nigeria is the state practicing Sharia. There are 12 states that have announced Sharia. Two of them do not still have Sharia penal court law, and I'll speak to some of this specific, uh, but these are the 12 states that have announced Sharia. Now, I want to pause here and say Sharia. We always had Sharia. Now, depending on what history we are reading, some suggested that we had Islamic Sharia from the seventh century. It came in through Borno Empire. But subsequently, we had from one of our speakers a few weeks ago that came. Uh, in the 11th to 13th century, we had the Islam that was coming in from the uh, northwest, which is the Sokoto Caliphate. And that was much later than the Borno, which has not been spoken about a lot. Uh, but it's, it's uh, informative to know that we had this Sharia, and the Sharia had always been in the Nigerian constitution, to the best of my knowledge, up to 1999, which is the current constitution. It is limited, the constitutional provision of the, of the Sharia is limited to issues of civil matters only. There are no criminal part of Sharia in the constitution of Nigeria. And I'm speaking about section 277 that created the jurisdiction of the courts of of uh, the Sharia Court of Appeal in Nigeria. Now, what we had in 1999 was the introduction of a new Sharia, which we call the new Sharia, which basically brought in five new offenses and five new punishments. There are many more offenses, but I'll just mention the five that we had in 1999. If you drink alcohol, you were flogged. If you commit adultery, zina. You'll be stoned to death if you are married or, or any semblance of marriage. If you steal, you have your limbs amputated. The concept of an, uh, 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 an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth was brought back. How you commit an offense, that is how you'll be uh, punished. And we have hiraba, which is uh, arm robbery. In, uh, you use arm um, and you killed and then you'll be crucified and then apostasy was introduced. So these are the five new offenses that came in. And I will show you the penal code of Northern Nigeria, which I have a, a clip here, and I have the book with me. Uh, what we had as Sharia under the penal code of Northern Nigeria is 
basically the same with the Sharia penal court law after 1999. Maybe 80 to 90% is the same. And uh, if you want us to talk about some of this detail, we could do that in Q&A. And I'll show you a little bit of that on the clip. So I just wanted to make this point for this slide. Now, I want to introduce this briefly, and I may come to it later. So this is the crowd. This is a typical Sharia court. And this is actually the case of Amin al So this is the courtroom. It's a male space. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. So this is actually a male space. And so it's a new space for our female advocate. And we could talk to that in a moment. The next slide is how do you negotiate a space as a female advocate? Uh, this is trying to negotiate a space. The, the first slide up there are the judges. These are the judges that acquitted Amin Lawal. The one in front unfortunately died a year after. Uh, the three judges were amazing. The third one on the row dissented. So we had a judgment that was accepted by these two, and nobody has yet studied the judgment of the third one, which is what I was trying to do at the point, and I, I'm still working on that. He's the only judge on appeal that said Amina should be stoned to death. So it was not a unanimous decision on the appeal court. So the third one said she should, still, she should be stoned, but because two agreed, she was set free and she was discharged and acquitted. Uh, that is the same courtroom part of it. And here is one I said the, the picture speaks a thousand words. These are, the, these are the lawyers in the front. And I will leave you to imagine what this picture is all about. I, I'm the first one there with the file. And you could see the male uh, lawyers um, practically with no book in front of them, but we could talk more about that. Um, this I got from um, Amnesty International. That, 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 I, I, I don't keep record. That's the problem I have with, without record. So this picture of the, of the lawyers, the third one on top, I got it on this paper, which is a Norway international newspaper, I mean magazine. Uh, it's Amnesty International, so I got the picture from there, which is actually this picture, if you can see it. Um, the next slide. So let me introduce the Nigerian legal system. And what I want to mention here is that the sources of our laws are the Nigerian constitution. We do have a constitution. The country has a treaty of government. It's similar to the United States constitution. We have the executive, the judiciary, and the legislators. We have legislation. We have the common law, which is a byproduct of our colonization from Britain. We have the Sharia. And then we have customary law and judicial precedents. So these are the sources of the Nigerian law. And we can talk about them in detail if you want in the Q&A. So just take note. Uh, we could speak to it. Uh, this is a hierarchy of the court we have in the country. The Supreme Court is the highest court in the land. The Supreme Court, uh, next to it, is the Court of Appeal. These two courts are, are called the sort of the federal court in a way. And all Nigerians are all entitled to all these courts, uh, depending on which one you want to uh, take your case to. But you have a right of appeal to the Supreme Court. That is a constitutional right by the Nigerian Constitution. Um, under, under the three, uh, the, the Court of Appeal, we have these three other courts. Each state, uh, we have 36 states in the country. Each of these 36 states have a right to have a, uh, a state high court. We have a federal high court which deals with special jurisdictional matters. And then we have the Sharia and customary courts of appeal. They are all, they have the same sort of jurisdiction uh, on the same line and they all appeal their cases. If there's any appeal, it goes from this court to the court of appeal. I will speak to that a little bit on Fatima's case because we, we didn't get to the Sharia Court of Appeal. Uh, we, we went there, but that was where the case sort of stalled a little bit. Uh, under those other three, three cadres of court, we have the magistrate and district courts. Then you have the Sharia and customary courts that the state usually will promulgate. Now, under this magistrate and district court and Sharia and customary court, states are allowed to go ahead and formulate and pass legislation to have as many courts as they want. And we also have traditional courts. So if you move from one village or from one society to another society, you are likely to find a court that is traditionally administered 
by the locality, which is not part of this, but is the state have right to do that? Okay, now the case of Fatima. Fatima was married and she had five children and she was divorced. And she came to stay with her father and this is year 1999 to 2000. She came to live with her father in the village of Lombata, that's the name of the village. Fatima's neighbor, her father's neighbor is a man called Amadou, which is the first picture you saw. Fatima fell in love with Amadou. Uh, sometime in 2000 and 2001, they had sexual relationship and Fatima became pregnant. Fatima became pregnant and the village was in distress. Remember, a woman is not supposed to be pregnant without a husband. It's not accepted in any of our society. So the village was completely distressed. And they decided we have to meet and resolve this matter. This has never happened here. So they call a meeting of the elders. And they call, it's an, elders are not women's space, it's male space. So they call Fatima's father and they call Amadou's parent. And Amadou was, was invited. And they had a discussion. And it was resolved, and Amadou accepted that the pregnancy of Fatima was his. It was shameful, he apologized. Fatima's father apologized. Fatima took, uh, Amadou took responsibility, and that was the end of the matter. Responsibility, he says, I will give you 300 naira every day. 300 naira is like $2. Every month, I'll, I'll give you that, Fatima's parent, to take care of the baby. The name of the baby, they name her Fyodosi. It's a girl. So I'll give you 300. But in addition to the 300, I'll go to the mountain. It's a precious, precious thing that he has accepted to do in our society to get wood. Because it's a, it's a real commodity to get wood to boil water. So I'll get you some wood to come and help in the process of the 40 days of bathing, the traditional bathing. But I will do a little bit more. I will also be bringing some water for the 40 days that you are in the period of the cultural bathing. So I'll, prov I'll give you water, make wood, and pay 300. 40 days was done, and he decided to withdraw with even the 300 naira he wasn't given. And Fatima's father was upset. And started demanding from Amadou, after all, your baby is ill. Fidelsi is so sick. I'm the only person taking care of her. I need more money. Amadou is a security guard in the market. He makes next to nothing. So he said, I don't have much money, but I will, you know, just be patient. I'll give you more money after, after some time. He never did. Fatima's father get upset. In the meantime, Fatima has got another husband. She has married and divorced and remarried. So she had married and divorced and remarried for the second time. And Fatima, Fatima's father wanted more money from Amadou. And when he couldn't get, you know, when she married, she couldn't take the daughter with her because the culture does not allow you to take another man's small baby with you when you get married to another house, to another man. So she left the daughter with her father, and that is a demand from her father to Amadou. So he couldn't give her, he couldn't get the money, and he decided to start discussing it. How can he get more money from Amadou? And he went to a friend, I said, I know what to do, I will help you. So he took him to the area court. Now they call it the upper area court. Remember, this is 2001. There was no Sharia in, in Niger State. Niger State started Sharia, and this state where this matter of Amadou is, is called Niger State. It's one of the state of Sharia that I showed in the map. So he took him to the Sharia court, uh, the upper, upper, Sharia, upper area court. And uh, the registrar said to him, you know what? We will get you some money from, um, from Amadou. And the, the father filed a charge, and the charge he filed was called defilement. Have you had that charge before? He defiled my daughter. So because he has defiled my daughter, I need him to do something to pay for that. The chastity of his daughter had been violated. So, uh, 
the case went on, Amadou was called to court, Fatima was called to court, there was an adjudication, the, the record of the court, which uh, I brought you a sample, uh, usually the record of the court will look something like this. It has three languages, so the, it has a bit of English, it has a bit of, a lot of Hausa and Arabic. So this is a typical record of the court. So you could see the Arabic inscription, if you can see. Mostly it's written in Hausa, and of course the case is in the, in the Sharia, Opa Sharia court of, okay? So if you want to talk about language, I want to, I will speak to that, but I want you to know there is much more than just simple case on the face of it. Um, so this is a typical case uh, court record. So, she, they were charged under, the, the, the charge the father filed was defilement. Now the court framed a charge. It framed a charge under the penal court law of Northern Nigeria, not Sharia. And he charged them under section two, 387 and 388 of this penal court laws of Northern Nigeria, which is the law that we have in operation since after independence in 1960. And what is the section saying? I'll show you a clip in a moment. The section is saying, is, is uh, speaking to adultery, and the punishment for adultery under this law is two years imprisonment or fine. But the judge fined them 10,000. And if they cannot pay fine, they should go and sign five years imprisonment. Remember, the law says two years. Okay? The judge say five years imprisonment or 10,000 naira. Of course, they, don't, they, they can't find 10,000. It's a lot of money. So they went to the prison, he sent them to the prison. And that is where we came in. That's the beginning of the judicial process for a lawyer like me. And that's where I begin. That's where my, my narrative now takes up. So what do you do when you have a case, a, a trial court record like this? But before this, the first thing we do as lawyers is to form a team. It's very important that you don't think it's a one-person show, it must be a team. A team of locals, and I'll speak to that at the end, beyond the courtroom. A team of people that uh, disagree with you, Mullahs or Hizba, or the people that implement Sharia, local lawyers, you just have a team. But after forming the team, what do you move? What do you do? You now go to the court, the trial court, and get this record. Now this record, like I said, is in three languages, so you have to really get the team that could understand those three languages so that you can be able to formulate the case. Okay? So, you get the trial court record, you articulate the issues, and I'll talk to the issues in a second. Then you file your case. Depending, in this case, we file it in the same court because we wanted bail. But I said I skipped something, let me come back. So you remember he, he has charged them, he has um, framed a charge under section 387 and 388. Five years or five, uh, uh, five years imprisonment or 10 year, 10,000 naira. Iklas, is that correct? Five years or 10,000 naira. Okay, yes, that's correct. Okay. He sat and reversed himself. The judge said, functus officio after he has completely performed his duties. The upper Sharia court judge of New Gau sat on his own and said, you know, the state announced Sharia some few weeks ago, so now because Niger State had become Sharia state, I am going to reverse my judgment without appeal. And he reversed his judgment. The first judgment was given on the 5th of August. He reversed his judgment on the 26th of August and charged them to be stoned to death. And when I spoke last year, I was saying, this Fatima's case is worse than Amina's case, and I will, I will get to that. So you understand where I was coming from? So the, the, both male and female are stoned? Yes, the yes, there was. Hear the woman. This is the first case I handled. Yeah. You are right. <laughs> For example, the Salman case, the Imam case, I usually see the figure of, I'm sorry, I'm trying. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad to do it. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm Turkish and I'm Muslim, but I still don't accept the idea of a woman to be stoned with that. I'm Muslim, I want to be. But uh, it's the first time I have ever heard that both of them used in context, not only now. 
and you are absolutely right. So actually, I have, been, I have defended three other men apart from this one. One is witchcraft, which is also sentenced to die by stoning, then Amadu, then another case uh, of stoning to death of a male adulterer. So anyway, uh, yes, we had had some male cases, which is a shame, though. We'll, we'll talk to that in Q&A a little bit. But thank you for interrupting. Please feel free. Jump in. Um, so the process is you, you take the trial court record, you articulate your issues, and generally speaking for lawyers, I always advise that you articulate issues in four different categories. Try to look from the court record what are the issues of law. Remember the case had already gone on trial, and most of the cases I mentioned to you over just 150 cases or more, they have already gone through trial. We come into the case on appeal. So the issues that is pertinent for us is the issues of law. So when you look at this proceeding in the trial court, pick out the issues of law, number one. Number two, are there issues of facts that are contradicting themselves that you want to raise on appeal? Issues of facts. Number three, now we have the substantive law, and then you have a procedural law. So is there any process and I will speak to two, two or this, I will take two small issues to illustrate these issues I mentioned to you. Procedural issue. And the last one is technicalities. So I say group the case in four, to try to get the entire perception from four different angles. What are issues of law? What are issues of fact? What are issues of procedure? What are issues of technicalities? So that is what we do. That is process number one. Then we argue our case, and then judgment is passed. These are what I mentioned to you, but let me take some of these issues just for, for the purpose of discussion. Uh, later, I'll just mention them. So assuming that we were looking at Fatima's case, what are the issues of law? I mentioned to you the sections of the law that was, uh, they were charged under, and then the reversal. So issues of law number one is Sharia, uh, the, the Penal Court of Northern Nigeria. You see the limitation of the punishment is two years. The punishment they were given by the court is five years. So this is an issue of law. The second issue of law I want to mention is fair trial. Both of them have right under the Nigerian constitution to have fair trial, section 36. So that is, these are two issues of law that we try to argue in Fatima's case on appeal. Issues of fact, charge of defilement, this factual issue on the face of the record. There's no charge like that in the penal court law. The second issue of fact I want to, that the judge sat on, himself, on, on his own judgment and reversed himself from to official and acted ultra virus, his powers. Issues of fact on the, fa on the face of the record. What are issues of procedure? Um, and I, let me bring this law to you here. Now this is the Sharia penal court law. I'm uh, sorry, the penal, law, penal court of Northern Nigeria, which is this one. So they were charged under section 387 and 388. Now, if you look at it very closely, this is the charge. On the face of the record, of the court record, the court must, must charge. If you, are, if you want to go out and you are charged for an offense, it must read a charge for you. And the charge is provided for by the law. Exactly the wordings are provided by the law. When a court does not adhere to this provision, you could argue it otherwise. And you can either make it as an issue of law or issue of process. But before I take off this slide, I want to point out two, three things. Where did we get Sharia Penal? Where did we get the Penal Court Law of Northern Nigeria? How did it come about? Did you see that up there? Sudan, Pakistan, mm -hmm. India. This are our, remember we are all British colony and they got independent before us. So when we are trying to put the Sharia, the Penal Court of Northern Nigeria before our independence, our leaders travel. So if you look at the introduction of this law, it tells you what happened, how they compiled this law. They went to Sudan, they started actually in India, then they went to Pakistan, then they ended up in Sudan, and they came and formulated this law for us. Okay? So at times you will look at the law like this, the Sharia Penal Court law, and they will give you some guidance. They will say, this is the departure 
as you could see. And we departed from section 497 of the Pakistani law on these grounds. Okay? So I, want, I just want to, to point out, and you could see the punishment there is two years. Before the comment, before the word comment, you could see right on top of it, the punishment is two years of fine or both. And this is for the male and this is for the female, section 280, uh, 389, no, so 387 is for the male, 388 is for the female, um, but it's the same process. But the charge, uh, we're talking about technicalities, there was, sorry, the procedure, there was no plea on the face of the record of the court. There was no plea. They were charged under this law, but this same plea was not given to them. Issue of procedure. The second issue of procedure I want to point out is the uh, is an assumption. Assuming they committed adultery, they committed zina, and they are pregnant, and they are supposed to be sentenced to die by stone. Assuming, come on. We are talking about Sharia uh, of Penal Court of Northern Nigeria. There are processes, there are procedures. In fact, this one has clearly stated. How do you prove it? The accused must have an intercourse. But you see, when he reversed himself and said that they committed zina, he put himself in a tighter corner. Because there are three basic proofs of zina. Who knows them? Anybody want to volunteer? Four witnesses, four males, Muslims, sin, of good character. Come to think of it, they saw the act really practical. There is no cover. I don't want to describe it, but you know, you know what I mean. They really saw the act. No, no, no one person will see the act and run and come and say, you come with me. Come and see what they're doing. No! And you know what some scholars have written about this? It's impossible. It's impossible for four men. Even if only this person is insane for four people to see you in the act of adultery. Assuming they committed that, that is a proof that he need to, they need to show that these four men have seen. If they have not come, who knows the punishment for them? 80 flogging publicly. If four men didn't come to say they have seen it together, they are liars. And it's as of, so they should be flocked 40. That is a provision of Sharia. The second proof of Zina is pregnancy, according to Abu. Now you can dispute pregnancy, we can argue it up and in and out. Come on, this is 20, 2002. With technology, at least in your country, you can go to a bank and get some, you know. The key word, the operative word for zina is sexual intercourse. For me, the key word there is penetration. Now, where there is no penetration, and then there is no zina. So, in essence, there is no proof on the face of the record of zina. Come on. Pregnancy as a conclusive proof of adultery of Zina. So that is an issue that was not clearly proved on the record of the trial court. The last issue. Anybody knows about the last issue? We, we spoke about witnesses, pregnancy. And she confesses. Exactly, confession. And confession is a hard thing to prove. Remember the Shubua prohibition. Professor Baba Johansson will, will say much about that. I went there this. Did she confess? Was the confession voluntary? Or was she coerced into confessing? Now we have hadith and the Quranic verse. You cannot, you cannot base a conclusion of the from confession, especially when there is a doubt. It must be resolved in the favor of the accused person. So assuming, let's assume that this is true. Okay, this have failed flat on the on the face of the record. So we are talking about those issues of law, fact, procedures, and uh, the last one is te te technicalities. So who reports the Who will report?
what is it? Before men or the father or Fatima or her husband. Now in some Pakistani decision that I read, it's like the husband report. And you know, he may have to take some oath. He may have to go through some other procedure. If you decide to say your wife has committed this, you have to show reason why they should be believed. In this case, Fatima was married. Fatima was remarried. Actually, she was in another husband's house when they went and got her and brought her to court. And she was pregnant, six months pregnant. So she was taken to prison with a six month pregnant that belongs to another woman. Mm -hmm. So you see, this is a bit so that is the case of Fatima. Her father reported. Her father wanted money for defilement. So this is one issue of technicality. The other issue of technicality I want to mention is that, remember I kept saying, there was no law in 2001. Actually, the law that, up to today when I cross-checked with the Federal Ministry of Justice and also the Minister of Justice and I before I came here, they have a bill before the House of Assembly. So there was an announcement in 2001 that the United States has become a Sharia state. And the administrative law was passed into law, the administrative law, not the substantive law, in November, on the 5th of November, 2002. So technically, there was no law when she allegedly committed zero. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Techn technically, you can knock it out completely. So on those grounds, we can, we can just knock out the case of Fatima. But these are grounds that we look at when we do the processing. Okay, I have shown you this slide. But let me go to the slide of the, the Hudud, which is actually the Zamfara State Sharia Penal Court Law. Now, what happened when Nigeria introduced Sharia? I mentioned to you that Sharia was announced by this state of Zamfara on the 25th of October, 1999. So all the laws that started the Sharia in most of the state took their lead from this Sharia Pina Court law. And it's in 2000. So the provision of Zana is section 126 and 127, and this is what it says. So you could see, technically speaking, if the judge, assuming the judge says, oh, we have become Sharia state, we don't have law, but we are going to go back to the manifestation uh, provision on Zana. This is what it says. But look at it very clearly. Whoever be a woman or a man fully responsible, her sexual intercourse through the genital of a woman, of a person over whom he has no sexual right and some circumstances in which no doubt exists, as a, come on. You can piece each word there. And you can come to a conclusion that technically speaking, on this, on this, on the substance of this law, what is the time now? Am I going to talk? No, no, he has passed. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you could see the intricacies of the law on its face. Okay? So I just want I, I want to reserve time for, for questions. Ah, I should stop this. Otherwise I'll go into law uh, too much. Yes. But you know, I noticed on the penal code before that an exception was made for rape. Yes. Um, and so that was very interesting to me that, I, I mean, it's hard to read it, but under C, that the sexual intercourse was not such as to amount to rape. Yeah. Um, and this doesn't have that provision. And was that, a, that you have not raised that as an issue in this case, that it was not an issue in this case, or it was and they didn't raise it? No, it was not an issue in this case at all. Now, because Fatima loved Amadou, I'm talking to you today. <laughs> if she will have opportunity to marry Amadou, she would divorce her husband and marry Amadou. So there was no rape per se. But why didn't they get married? Uh, Amadou is younger. Amadou has one child. His wife is younger, and he said that he doesn't want to have you know a problem with his in his home having an older woman coming in as a second wife. That was his excuse. Yes. I think um, I, 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 I know this is not uh, part of Sharia, but the issue here really is one of child support. What the father wanted was child support. And 
it is a, it's an issue because the Nigerian law does not have anything about child support. So what you have are so many children being born that at the end of the day, nobody is really, it, it comes the state's responsibility because really all the child, street children, that is the problem. And that if you have child support, people will be more responsible with the amount of children. And it, it, it is an issue and in terms of the real problem because it is a child support problem. And you know you are right, but unfortunately when the judge said they should be stunned to death, it became a Sharia case. I, I know, but we need to bring the conversation yes, to child support. Without a doubt. Whether it is, um, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what, what happened, but that somebody should be responsible that if you have a child, not just the person that actually has the child, but the person, the two people should come into the picture and need to start that conversation somewhere. You know, you are absolutely right, but let me tell you a little bit. Are you from Nigeria? Which part? I'm from the southwest. Okay, so, so for us in the north, customary the, the, for us in the north, the, the child belongs to the society. So when you start talking about child support as a legal matter, it's like another discussion. Because I didn't grow up with my family, I grew up with my uncles, with my aunties, maybe it's you have it in the south, I don't know. But a child is a societal responsibility. So in, uh, in an essence, maybe Malanubu has a word to say about the North. Oh, you're right about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I just yeah. my, my, in the North. My, my, my concern, though, I, I agree with all that, but once what we're having, the effect of not discussing child support, I say society, and I, I think it's the most traditional no, I society agree to agree that society, but when the child is on the street and it's society's responsibility, Society has to do something to get the... I agree. The, 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 the I agree. He had to say something. Let me, let me conclude. Go ahead. Let me go. No, I, I'm not a lawyer, but I think there are laws in Nigeria for child support. No. I, no, I was a legislator. There's no, no, no. Because as a child, yeah. I grew up in a state. There are women in my village that took men to the court. It was the customary court. No, no. I'm telling you, even my mother wanted to do it for my father. So I'm, I'm a product of that. So there are, in there were certain, maybe in State, there were some laws that authorize these women. Now, the question whether the women are aware of it, whether they enforce, is a different matter. But the British left some law there that, that you could sue the men. Because I, I knew that my family had to go through that. Were they, were they legally married? If they were legally married, they were and then they were going to, if they were married in a court, let me tell you what, because I was a legislator in Nigeria, if they were married in a court of law, a Western mm -hmm. wedding, well, then they can go mean, into a court of law, and during the divorce process, you can get child support. If you were never legally married, or uh, then you have no recourse, you can't do child support. It is, it's the, so you can't do child support unless there was a wedding. So May I, let's let's excuse, sir, sir, excuse me. Excuse me. Finish hearing the talk. Yeah, let, and let's just ask if Helen can finish her prepared mm -hmm. comments and then we can engage in a more informal conversation. Okay, she, she, she's about. <laughs> so we'll do that. Okay, now, actually, what is happening is interesting for two reasons. He is from the southeast, she's from the southwest, I'm from the north. So it's like Nigeria here. <laughs> and so you are hearing, uh, like I say, Sharia is only in the north, as you saw. There is no Sharia in the south. Uh, the South is mainly Christian, the North is mainly Muslim, a different culture, a different perspective, a little bit. Uh, also different from the South East. Uh, but it's an interesting discussion, I'm sure you can work with it later. But let me conclude by saying, beyond the courtroom, what next? Beyond the courtroom. So I'll mention three things and I'll stop. Now for me, we can win. Okay, let me, let me, let me go back to this case a little bit, to conclude that case. So they were in, in prison, we met them in prison, we filed uh, bail sometime in October 2003. And they were in prison maybe for two or three months then. Um, they, were dis they were given bail um, in a very interesting way, we can go into the, how they got the bail. And then they, were, they went home. But the case is not over because we did file a case before the Sharia Court of Appeal in Mina, Niger State. Um, we have to do that because we have 30 days on which by law, if we don't appeal, we may have them back in the prison. So we have to go to the Court of Appeal. But after going to the Court of Appeal, come on, this is the, maybe the 20, 30 case that I've been part of. 
and now we have become a little wiser. Remember, up to today, we still have 1999 Nigerian Constitution, which is the grand norm of the country, which is the operational law in the country, which is the one that provided actually for all the states. Okay? So what had happened, the reintroduction of Sharia has not affected the 1999 Constitution. The Sharia court, you saw the hierarchy of the court. The Sharia court is a creation of 1999 Constitution. <clears throat> so what we did was to go back to the Sharia court in writing, I wrote a letter. And I said to them, may it please your lordships, uh, we, we have this case of Fatima and Ahmadu versus the Commissioner of Police before you, which we brought, but we want you to give us a practice direction. Since your court is a constitutional court, and the jurisdiction of your court is limited to civil matters, no criminal matter, give us a practice direction. You know what the court said? You could guess. Like we hear her say, ha, they called me. Are you crazy? <laughs> Did we ask you to bring the case before us? <clears throat> Why are you a troublesome person? You brought the case and you're coming to us and say, give us back. Did we ask you, just get out of here, Hawa. We don't want you and your trouble. And so that was really, uh, who's called it? out of my mind, I'm as a banana to do that. But you see, it's necessary at a point to be careful about strategy and about tactics. And for me, it's good for us to, 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 feel, to diffuse the tension in the society, to go to court. But at this point, we want to take, to assert something, to change something, and to change something. We have to change it from within. So that's how somehow they dismiss the case. They never put the case again on their on their court list, they put the case, we don't go to them to do, they to put the case on their court list, and that was the end of Fatima's case. Mm -hmm. And they are free. Mm -hmm. And she has other children with another husband. <laughs> Third one. I'm <laughs> happily married with his children. He has three children, now I saw them last in January. Finally, beyond winning the case in court, what do you do? Remember, in a lot of these other cases, not Fatima's case, we want them to go back and live in their society. We don't want them just to win the case. Oh, you have won the case, and then they'll go back like in Somalia, and they stone her to death. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, it's not victory. We, we have lost woefully. So it's the ability for us to work within the system, to work with the mullahs, to work with the hizba, to work with all necessary allies we needed. As a matter of fact, we were working with the blind, with the lepers. Mm. We wanted any ally that is necessary for us to get on board so that they can enhance them going back home. It's very necessary. Work within, work with allies. Okay? Work within Sharia, work within the law. I have given an example of how you can use Sharia to argue Sharia cases. And one of the examples I have given in the past is the sleepy embryo theory. Now, he said, he said the, the Maliki law says a woman can be pregnant for a minimum of five years or maximum of seven years, mm -hmm. or six months, or five or seven years. Mm -hmm. she can, a woman can be pregnant for a minimum of six months, a maximum of five or seven, depending on which of the Maliki's law you are looking at. Mm -hmm. I didn't say it, it is a law. <laughs> so the point I'm making is that we use that section. We practice Maliki law. We say, you know, in Amina's case, the baby must have been sleeping. The baby is a sleeping embryo. Because she was divorced from her husband 11 months before she became pregnant and she was charged to be stoned to death. One of the cases of stoning to death, I mean, I So we use the sleeping embryo argument to argue that same case. So within Sharia, there are things that you use to argue Sharia cases. And I can go on and on. So I have encouraged lawyers, and I'll still say it here, that there is a need for us to work within the Sharia because we have solution within the Sharia, not outside, not to the common law, not to the customary law, not to, no, 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 not the traditional law, no, within Sharia. Work within Sharia, work within the court. And the last thing I wanted to say with that respect is, for me as a female lawyer, and I told you about female space, is how do you claim the space? How do you make it your sparkling? It's not, it's not academic. For me, what I've learned, 
from those years is that I have to outwork. Outwork them. Work out of the box. Work to the ratio of two to one. You, you, you cannot sleep and go to court with no paper in front of you and be relevant. You want to be relevant? Be an authority. When you speak, people should listen to you. So we don't come to court lightly. No, 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 no. We make sure we don't sleep in the night because we want the morning to be better. Weeping may endure for the night, but the joy will come in the morning. So you outwork them, and you become relevant, and you can be part of the space. But let me also tell you what I have done in conclusion. As a, as a lawyer, as a human being, I have learned from the good book. And I wake up daily to think about some of these things. You say something like, oh, I was thirsty and you gave me water. I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. And the, the answer from the good book from Mr. Sapi says something like, oh, what did you before? Why are you thirsty when we gave you water to drink? Or oh, what did we clothe you when you are? And he said, when you do it unto this people, Fatima and I don't take funds for what I do. You do it unto me. When you do it to me, you do it unto the Almighty. So I have learned in my practice that is doing unto others, not because they have something to give us. It may sound very silly because I'm in the United States environment. You don't take money, how do you get your money? You know, I have been paid, and I started by saying I have been paid by Harvard. You know what you have done in this, is in this both students and lecturers and everyone here, the Jane especially, and the dean. You have given me an opportunity not only to rethink and recreate myself, but bringing the Sultan has changed over 80 million people from where I come from. If I have collected money and paid, maybe, maybe I would maybe, maybe not. So I have been paid. I have not been paid by clan because they cannot afford to pay me. But do unto others. Give them the water. Clothe them when they are naked. You do it unto the Lord. And that is what I have learned in my practice. And most importantly, I just want to say thank you so much for giving me your ears to bore you to death this afternoon. <laughs> Oh, you've taught us a number of things today, and not the least of which is how to claim your space. You've done that beautifully here today.